Hi, this is Laura Forehand from the Desert Sanctuary Podcast. The following is a conversation neither David Hayward nor Carl necessarily wanted to have. However, because they find themselves in shepherding roles, they feel a responsibility to protect survivors of spiritual abuse and church harm. The problem of the patriarchy is as old as time, but it continues to sabotage the good work that is otherwise being done. To accurately describe it, they had to give examples, and they tried to always do that as gently as possible. This is a conversation between two former pastors and a pastor's wife, who are genuinely concerned for the welfare of those travelers here in the desert. I think I can safely speak for all of us when I say that we couldn't care less about popularity and or being on the stage. However, we simply wanted to have an honest conversation about this pervasive and reoccurring issue in religion. If people didn't want us to mention what they did, they probably shouldn't have done it. As Carl always says, be where you are, be who you are, and be at peace. Welcome to the Desert Sanctuary with Carl and Laura Forehand. Often when we have doubts about religion or simply want to ask questions, it can feel like we are wandering out into the desert. We would like to invite you to join our sanctuary, the Desert Sanctuary. We've tried to pick guests that would resonate with and challenge us and our fellow seekers here in the desert. We believe that a key to the journey is to keep asking good questions, and we believe that all stories are sacred. Our hope is that you will find life and healing for your body and mind, and that you will be able to be where you are and be who you are. And now, here is our show. Hi there. Welcome to the Desert Sanctuary Podcast. I'm Laura Forehand. I am here with Carl Forehand. Mm -hmm. I feel like I always have to say your last name. I don't know why. That started a while back, and I'm not sure. Like, I don't know any other Carl, so I'm not sure why I have to say Carl Forehand, but... (laughs) There you it's go. All right. Let's just be clear, right? <laughs> yeah, just to be clear. You're respecting the patriarchy. That's what it is. You're, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as you can hear, we have a very special guest, David Hayward, also known as the Naked Pastor. And David is a pastor turned artist who is painting, drawing, and thinking about what it takes to be free to be you. Mm-hmm. Love that message. Yeah. And I, my experience. Carl Forehand is speaking now. <laughs> <laughs> Who's married to Laura Forehand? By the I way. almost feel like I'm kind of going up to the mountain here, but uh, I know David well. I know his humility. So I know he doesn't, mm-hmm. he's not going to hold that over me. But people refer to him out in the, he's one, you know, like Michael Jordan, you could say one name and you know who Michael Jordan mm-hmm. is. People say DH for David Hayward <laughs> or NP for Naked Pastor. And as people talk about you behind your back, yeah, uh, <clears throat> they use initials. So I know you've been around a long time. They say you started deconstructing before deconstructing was a word. I know you to be very kind, uh, an advocate for LGBTQ, mm-hmm. um, a firm voice against organized religion or pointing out the flaws in organized religion. You can correct any of this if you want. Uh, Also an artist and creative contributor um, and someone who's developed, actually developing community out in what we call the desert. So first of all, what do you have to say to that, David? How how are you? Welcome to the podcast. I'm good. Thanks. And thanks for having me on your show. And hi, everybody out there who's listening. Uh, You know what? Um, I, I was, when you say I was deconstructing before deconstruction was the word used to describe you know, deconstructing from the faith or whatever. Everybody down through history, deconstruction has been a thing. It's always been here. I I just co-opted the word Mm -hmm. to describe the process of uh, questioning your beliefs, changing your beliefs, you know, questioning your faith, uh, all that, you know, um, losing your faith, leaving the church, all that falls under deconstruction for me. And uh, I had, I, I was, it was back in 2008, I was reading the French philosopher uh, Jacques Derrida. He was the one who actually coined the the fray, uh, the word deconstruction. He, he invented the word deconstruction. And um, but when I was reading him, and, you know, I'm not a philosopher by any means, but 
uh, as much as I could understand. It seemed to me the way he was talking about deconstructing and questioning the text and, and all this kind of thing really described what I was experiencing in my own faith. It wasn't just, oh, was there a six day creation or was it, you know, is the earth a hundred million years old or, you know, was there a flood or was, is this myth or was there a historical Jesus, all this stuff, or, or is the Bible inspired or not? For me, it went even deeper is all the questioning everything, absolutely everything, including the people who were teaching me mm -hmm. and the institutions that were teaching me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I was questioning everything, which is really the deconstruction process. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, when we get a text, like, so when somebody says, well, Jesus said, and I, I have to say, well, somebody claiming to be John said, Jesus said, mm -hmm. and then that has gone through so many edits mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know and inscriptions and you know so on uh that you know we're you cannot say jesus said anymore you mm -hmm. cannot say that <clears throat> you can say it's claimed to you know john somebody claiming to be john claims that jesus said yeah. so you know that that's the the level to which my questioning went so I started using the word deconstruction in 2008, 2009, and so on. And, you know, I was being labeled a deconstructionist and so on way back then before it was a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I started the Lasting Supper, an online community for people who were deconstructing. That was in 2012. It's still going. Um, and then, I don't know, it was like uh, the beginning of COVID or something when deconstruction actually became what some people called a movement. <laughs> the deconstruction movement yeah oh so, you know it's it's uh it's a it's a big deal now so but it's it's been over a decade that i've you know well gee it's been 15 years now mm -hmm. uh, using the word deconstruction to describe the very natural process that people have been doing for centuries and millennia and that is questioning their beliefs mm -hmm. that's all i'm using it for and uh it's just the word i use instead of you know using the word backsliding or being tempted of the devil or, or whatever <laughs> for me it's uh questioning your beliefs it's that the word is deconstruction mm -hmm. because in the word deconstruction right it's your d you're taking it apart right mm -hmm. and you're look examining it i call it the marie condoing of our faith where you the japanese minimalist uh person who helps people declutter their homes and get rid of stuff mm -hmm. uh, and just keep what gives you joy. It's the same with beliefs. Uh, I, I Marie Kondo is an excellent example of what you'd throw at everything you're not using. That's not useful. And you only keep that, which brings you joy. And um, so that for me is deconstruction. I know people are talking about me behind my back and they're not only talking about me behind my back, they're also talking about me in public uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, using my name yeah. uh, and attaching it to this demonic, you know, um, deconstruction movement um, as one of the thought leaders and all this kind of thing. I just saw a video the other day on YouTube where my name was brought up and, um, you know, that and that deconstruction is a bad thing and it's my fault and other people's fault. Yeah. Um, it's become so popular. So. I understand their uh, anxiety about it all because it, it's uh, it's changing the complexion of the church. Mm -hmm. um, it's changing the complexion of theology today. Mm -hmm. um, but um, and I, you know, I don't have any. I don't feel any animosity towards any of, of these people that are talking about that. But I do. I do feel I need to uh, correct what they're saying or or balance what they're saying or give my give perspective time, what yeah. right. i do a lot of cartoons around this mm -hmm. where um you know car, uh, deconstruction is not a bad thing this is a natural and healthy thing mm -hmm. and um it should happen you know and and so uh i i would like to um you know i i ever since the whole fiasco happened many years ago uh with uh you know mark driscoll tony jones and all that stuff went down mm -hmm. i was pretty vocal in all that and um i really got burned 
by that. Uh, I, I sort of um, changed strategies mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, but now it's like these guys are starting to emerge again. Mm -hmm. And I don't care about the guys, but I care about what they're teaching. Right. Yeah. And it's dangerous stuff. It's poison. So I feel like I need to sort of uh, raise my voice again when mm -hmm. it comes to some of this stuff. It's dangerous. So I'm going to respond to some of these things um, and, yeah. and try to yeah. help people understand my perspective. I, I know that if, if by default I'm going to do what my dad did, I have his DNA. And, and by default, that's what happens. And over time, um, you know, as I participate in things like evangelical Christianity and the, the same thing happens, that DNA gets passed on to me metaphorically or whatever. Right. But we're, it seems like in, in, in um, progressive Christianity, in a lot of the deconstruction movements, by default, and it's to, to me, it's when people don't heal properly. You know, it's when they come out and say, I want to change some things, we want to reinvent Christianity and so on, but they don't bother to heal from the trauma that they already experienced. Right. They just drag that stuff along with them. And in the recent incident where, you know, we've got a, an accused abuser on, on a platform and, and other people that haven't healed don't address that just avoid it then right. it hurts a lot of people you know because for yeah. every guy on stage there's a thousand guys wanting to be on that stage in yeah. some cases and it's it it's i i fear that it's going to become toxic again you know that there's there's going to be just as much of that in deconstruction circles as as another as an evangelicalism mm -hmm. do you agree or you think that yeah no, it's, it seems to be heading that way. Remember when the emergent movement mm -hmm. um, was uh, rising um, and becoming a big thing, uh, you know, and there was like Tony Jones, Brian McLaren, Doug Padgett. Um, um, I think Rob Bell was, even though Rob Bell seems to uh, be kind of more independent, he wasn't really involved with that. Right. group i think he was sort of lumped in with them and so that whole kind of that whole kind of school and then there was, seemed to be competition for who's going to be the leader and you know um and and the strategies tactics that were being used at the time and it 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 quickly and i've talked with all all of these guys but it it, it blew up it blew up because the the uh the strategies that were abusive and um, um, the thirst for power uh, and, and all this just, it just imploded. Mm -hmm. And I, I made a video years ago. It was at the beginning of COVID warning people about the same thing would happen to the deconstruction mm -hmm. thought. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to call it a movement. I want to avoid it. It's not a movement. Mm-hmm. It's just a whole bunch of people experiencing the questioning of their beliefs. That's all it is. I don't want it to be a movement. Mm -hmm. I don't want leaders. Mm. I don't want to be a thought leader among deconstructionists. Right. When you say ism or ists, you're you're isolating it and making it a thing when it's not a thing. Right. And and so I'm reacting to that. Mm -hmm. But this is just a very normal human process of questioning your beliefs. It's called maturity. It's right. called an adult it's called thinking your own thoughts right critical yeah. thinking yeah critical thinking and so um you know i'm 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 very i feel like it's i'm i feel like i'm being pulled back in again to challenge that whole um it's like you say there's a lot of people want to be on stage there's a lot of people want to be in the limelight people, a lot of people there's a thirst for power and 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 this celebrity culture thing where the the people that we know yeah. it's documented are abusive. Yeah. Right. Right. Are rising again, not by their own power, but by those around them. Yeah. I don't get it. You know, so it's uh it's it's baffling to me. And and I, I feel it's time to wish in a warning again. 
So in, in 500 AD or so, in that time frame, mm. Constantine. It's before my time, but. Yeah, way before. <laughs> I'm a little older than you, maybe. I don't know. Um, essentially created the big building, the stage, the elevated platform. All of that came about when the, you know, when the scripture was canonized and so on. Right. It's, it's my assumption to some degree that. Uh, or assertion that the platform uh, and or theologians, probably both of them, <laughs> is what causes the problem. I mean, uh -huh. think about most theology are really just solving problems of the the, the previous theologians. You know, we're just re -cor we're correcting that, and then we have the Reformation, and and then we have now. 15,000 different denominations and more mm -hmm. confusion yet. So, so is it theologians or just narcissists or is it all of the above? Uh, who's to blame? Well, I, I do have an opinion about that. Yeah, um, love this, it, is, this is one of the posts that got me and was the start of the whole Tony Jones thing mm -hmm. many, many years ago when, uh, Tony Jones was critiquing Mark Driscoll um, about how Mark, you know, Mark Driscoll is like a neo-Calvinist, I guess, and, you know, very, yeah, Calvinist, very Calvinist, sort of the new Calvinist movement and everything. Yeah. And, and, and how, you know, his theology was sort of shaping his behavior and so on. And I challenged that by writing a post called what came first, the thug or the theology? I might sh not have, sh should have used the word thug because that's related to, to uh, cultures that I'm not a part of. But um, what my, the point of that article, the point of that post was, I believe we choose theologies that suits us best. Mm -hmm. Nobody, nobody believes what they don't want to believe. Everybody's believing what they believe because they want to believe it. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, we 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 find a theology that suits our biases and and paradigms and opinions and so on so we wear theology like a suit religion is like a, a suit to us it's, it's like clothing mm -hmm. to, to to adorn our uh dispositions mentally, emotionally, and so on. So when people uh, believe in a theology that discriminates against LGBTQ plus people, it's because they hate LGBTQ plus people. And they have found a theology that endorses and justifies their mm -hmm. perceived opinions and biases and um, hatred. Yeah. So th that's, that's my opinion about theology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And so... My point with the whole Mark Driscoll and Tony Jones thing is that Mark Driscoll has found a theology that he he uses to amplify his hatred and his impatience and his cruelty and his patriarchy and misogyny and all that. He's found a perfect theology. Yeah. And 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 then it becomes a vicious cycle where his theology uh you know feeds this, you know. Um, let's say misogyny feeds the misogyny and then the misogyny feeds his theology and it just gets c completely crazy and out of hand mm -hmm. so that eventually he can call his wife a penis home. Yeah. That's insane. Right. right? It's Who calls wife a penis home? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's, that's what I'm talking about where he, his misogyny um, has found a theology that will feed his misogyny mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what I think is happening out, out there. Uh, and, and me, we're all, you, Laura, me, we're all, we're all. That's why I think it's the most important exercise that we can do is to examine our hearts honestly mm -hmm. and our thinking honestly. That's deconstruction. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's deconstruction where we say, wait a minute. Why am I irrationally hating on LGBTQ people? Or why am I racist? Or why do why do I think I'm better than a woman? Right. Or, or, you know, and then and then that starts the deconstruction process. You know, 
I I critique the theology, but it's it's important to also critique uh go to the root, to take the axe to the root. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and um what so that's why that's why when we say say when we challenge LG um homophobia, for example, or transphobia or something, and they say, well, it's not me, it's the Bible. Immediately they've deflected because they they don't want to when we say it's hatred mm -hmm. towards uh, gay people, mm -hmm. they say it's not me, it's the Bible. Well, that's deflection and and that's you using your theology as armor, as a cloak. Mm -hmm. uh, and really, the root of it is your hatred. And that's where, where the work needs to be done. Because isn't it amazing that people who hate gay people find scriptural support for that, but people who love gay people find scriptural support for that too. Yeah. So once you change your heart, the, the world around you changes. Your perspective changes. The mm -hmm. scriptures change. Everything changes. And so that's that's what I feel my mission is in the world, is to you know take the ax to the root. And and um, challenge these people that you know they're it's not they're not it's not the scripture it's not theology it's your heart mm -hmm. right that, that needs fixing and it's it's how they're treating anyone that would get in their way or disagree with them mm -hmm. yeah or just be kind of a hindrance because they have a mental illness you know right. and all those things happen. Uh, and there's lots of lots of screen prints and documentation about it and things like that. Yeah, very hard at all. You find it pretty fast. That yeah. you know what really bothers me. You know, I I extremely don't like it that that people hate other people. But when I feel like I have to respond, is when not just that they have ill will towards people, but they're actually hurting people, and. Mm -hmm in in quote unquote normal churches people are being traumatized every day and this like you said that movie star mentality the the show business side of religion uh hurts a lot of people uh yes. mentioned mark driscoll uh mark mark driscoll uh, destroyed so many lives mm. yep he did. i know and you know, then then he would be mad because we we're talking about him saying that he destroyed so many lives. Um, you know, abuse survivors are saying, who's going to speak up for me? Who's going to believe my story? And, and, and how, you know, how do I possibly fight the patriarchy mm -hmm. that's alive and well out here in the desert in the deconstruction zones? Right. Yeah. It's, 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 it is this encouraging to see um you know like years ago the de the uh, people talking about deconstruction it was uh fairly sane and um there were interesting conversations going on and then the organized uh church folk uh like the defenders of the faith and so on uh, I don't know if they saw that this was bigger, a bigger deal than they reckoned, or if they thought, you know what, this is this is uh, our opportunity to, you know, cache in on this uh, thing. Yeah, and and, and um, so you know they started without even talking to anybody. They started uh, labeling uh, deconstruction as demonic backsliding an excuse to have free sex you know all this kind of nonsense they never they never asked me that i never said yeah. that mm -hmm. so it, it's 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 uh it seems like it's very opportunistic um there are people um saying crazy insane things about deconstruction uh and for me they must just want the limelight you know they must want the attention mm -hmm. um and perhaps there's a lot of insecurity there too, because more, more and more people are are leaving the church in droves because it's no longer a safe space mm -hmm. for them to to grow spiritually or to you know um, 
question their beliefs. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's it's too bad because it's attracted. It's almost like um, evil abhors a vacuum. It's like if there's if there's no. Th- this is one of the key features of people who are deconstructing is their rejection of authority. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's a positive thing. Mm-hmm. And what does what what happens? People with authority and power and influence get sucked into it because you know now they're you know they can get a following or. Mm-hmm. Yeah. get some attention and get some followers. Right. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting to me. Those, those are the, uh, those are the, the false shepherds who are attempting to steal, you know, the flock. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, the, I think they're very, very dangerous. And they're just trying to pull people right back into what uh, people are trying to deconstruct from. Right. You know, and I, I see it working on some people. So it's mm. distressing. So if I was talking, it's different. A few years ago, you know, I had four or five pastor friends out here in the desert, and we were all, we didn't know what we were doing or anything, and I still don't. But <laughs> my advice to them today would be different, I think, than when I started out. I think I would say, um, one, make sure one thing you don't do for however long it takes uh, until you can get some therapy, uh, some trauma-informed counseling, uh, until you can build some close relationships where you can tell your story mm-hmm. like that, um, then don't don't even start a Facebook account <laughs> where you have followers. I mean, you know what I mean? I, I mean, not friends and people you talk to and your family and things like that. But, but don't even attempt to get a following. I, I mean, we've always written books. That's the way we process things and so on. But the temptation is there to, well, maybe I could make some money. Maybe this will go viral. You know, all those temptations you have, mm-hmm. um, especially if you have, have narcissistic kind of ten- tendencies and you love the stage, um, I, I would really warn them harshly to to. S- just slow down and get better before you try to lead something. There's there's a, an ex Mormon out here in the desert that's that's deconstructed all the way. I think she calls herself an atheist, maybe not, but she but her beliefs are not necessarily athe- It's it's strange, but she says a lot of us are coming to the same place in, intuitively. We we didn't have to have you know, a structure and a leader and someone on right. the stage and all that to prosper out here in the desert. We're coming yeah. to that when we go in, and this is what I wanted to, I wanted to ask you this specifically. How important is it to go inside um, to, to do that discovery? Um, and I'll just leave it as kind of vanilla as that. Can you, can you, can you, what was your healing like? What do you recommend? How do you, how do you suggest people get better while they're out here? The question was six well, months long. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, I am really resistant to therapy because <laughs> I am your typical male who, you, you know, doesn't need directions. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're the last to ask for directions. Right. And, and so I, I'm, I kind of am typical that way. Um, but there have been times in my life, like, for example, when I left the ministry in 2010, Lisa and I left the church as a result. And I didn't realize it, but I was traumatized. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, experiencing, I, I was totally numb to the point where a couple of years later, Lisa was finally like, you need therapy. Mm-hmm. And realizing she was she was right i needed therapy and so i went and got i got went and got therapy um i found a local therapist i found a, a therapist online uh, a coach situation who totally got my understood me um had been in the vineyard and you know which was where i was and you know all this deconstructed all that kind of thing 
And then, um, yeah, other coaches, uh, I started the Lossing Supper, which was a, like an online community where I could vent and they could vent and we could share. And, uh, and then um, talking with some friends and with Lisa, Lisa and I, that sort of launched a conversation between us. So yeah, it's, it's really, really, really important, absolutely necessary to, you know, get, get therapy, get help. Um, they don't call them blind spots for nothing. They're, they're blind spots because we can't see, you might think you're okay, but how do you know you're not looking at a blind spot and there's, you know, traffic, oncoming traffic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. And, and in fact, I tell people therapy is always good. It's always good. It's never bad mm -hmm. unless it's bad therapists, of course, but like <laughs> therapy, always, always good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've always got a, you know, a therapist or a coach or somebody I I'm, you know, talking with to help me process my stuff. Yeah. And, you know, when the lasting supper, there was a period of time when I was also promoting it as a place for people to recover from spiritual abuse. And that was a mistake because I think people who have suffered spiritual abuse, religious abuse, church trauma, whatever, they need to see a counselor. You need to go to therapy one-on-one -on -one so that you can get to the place where you're healthy enough to deal with social settings and community. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because when I promoted the Lasting Supper as a place for spiritual abuse recovery, uh, it got really, really messy because there were people there who had not healed um, and and were trying to process their uh, trauma in in a group setting and it was it was just chaos it was just messy it it mm. it wasn't good mm. and so you, you know we all need therapy we all need help it's always good to talk to somebody to to get to the place where we can function in a healthy manner in our relationships mm -hmm. and yeah i needed that you need that we all need that yeah and it's it's just helpful and a good therapist or a coach is worth their weight in gold. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody who's had one that's been good knows they could testify just how helpful mm -hmm. and life-changing it was to, to be able to speak to someone in that way. We always say it's life-changing to tell your story to somebody. Mm -hmm. that yeah. It's because it's sacred. It's something you know you hold close to you. And if you can find somebody you trust mm -hmm. to share your story with, it's... It's somatic. It's healing. Um, yeah. And you know, you know, back to our story. Putting someone up on stage, the, the worst thing you can do for a narcissist is put him on stage, right? Because then he, he she never deals with with their shit. You know, they never yeah. deal with their stuff, um, and they've got the you know constant affirmation that they're mm. right and everybody else is wrong mm. so um i you know i think I, I i personally fight that battle every day you know should you know i have something of value i want to give to people uh, i want to help people that's how we all start out right mm. that's that's why yeah. we went into ministry and things like that yeah but we never intended to hurt someone, but Laura and I have had to examine who did we hurt? How did mm -hmm. we contribute to the problem mm -hmm. over our 20 years of ministry? Mm -hmm. But but all that that needs to be evaluated, admitted, you know, told yeah. to someone. Um, and then, but, but this, something is still true that um, narcissists, personality disorders the word is that that those things generally don't improve um hardly ever it's very 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 hard and it's it's probably especially hard when you're denying it and punishing other people for calling you on it you know again well, by example my observations and my experience is that the church loves and rewards narcissistic leaders. Mm -hmm. yeah. It does. Yeah. That's right. And, and it, it sort of feeds into that whole celebrity culture thing where 
you know, we're seeing it now in, in the actual celebrity world where people are being accused of, you know, abuse, uh, a sexual assault, even rape. And, you know, they, they, they reinvent themselves and come back as gurus. And we're all like, oh, you know, they're believers. They believe in God. They're gurus now. And, you know, and we for, forgive and forget and we put them back in the seat of power again. Mm -hmm. um, and within weeks or months, like it's, it's incredible. And the church does the same thing where, you know, uh, hardly even slaps on the wrist, you know, um, the Catholic church trans transferring priests around and mm -hmm. uh, but the Southern Baptist church and other, all kinds of other churches. I've seen all kinds of spiritual abuse in the church and it's systemic mm -hmm. and it, it manifests itself by uh, individuals participating with the system mm. and, you know, it feeding off of each other. And it's, I, I think, I think spiritual abuse is rampant. You know, I, I really think it's a part of the fabric it's a part of, of, the, yeah. of the church. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the, I think the, the, church's number one job should be preventing that from happening that should be job one mm -hmm. is is um trying to avoid abuse from happening that should be job one yeah. and take 99 percent of its effort to do that and i think that it would be a far better place you know yeah you gotta stop you gotta stop the trains and we've also got to get rid of that idea we've, we've interviewed a lot of women in the past six months and a lot of them are abuse survivors, and they call they call it the F word, forgiveness, and because they were forced to forgive, they were forced to enter back into the presence abusive of an abuser situation. and yeah, abusive systems and yeah, people. Um, you know, and we saw that online into last year. You know where those survivors tried to speak up and and they just got shut down. They got ignored. And that's, you know, that's where my heart is. I, I don't want to, you know, if someone's popular, I don't want to take them down because they're popular, but I don't want them to hurt people. Right. And I don't want them to keep creating systems that hurt people. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's, that's why we got in this deal in the first place was to help people not to make money and not, you know, yeah. I'm not against making money, but the stage, the popularity, the show business, you know, is just what it is now. And uh, mm. it's not what it should be. If it mm. needs to exist at all, like you said, let's spend 99% of the time becoming more trauma informed and actually helping people get better. Uh, starting with starting with the narcissistic pastors and theologians that that keep it going. Well, my solution was to leave. Mm -hmm. I I worked within the system, and I saw how toxic it was, and how it just sort of seeps into your skin mm -hmm. um, when you're a part of the system, mm -hmm. and um, it's really hard you know, while you're in the system. Now, I'm not saying I tucked my tail between my legs and ran away. Uh, I served the church as a pastor for about 30 years. So it's not like I gave up through in the towel too soon. I mean, I retired at an early age. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I, I'm i still in the game, but I'm not in the system. Right. And, you know, I think organized religion is a thing. It's going to be here forever. It's going to be here to stay. Uh, and we've seen the church has a remarkable ability to survive all kinds of persecution. Uh, it'll go underground uh, if it needs to, but it'll it'll always exist. So my point is, if we if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Let's do it in a healthy manner. And so I'll continue to challenge the church and church leaders and the system and all that kind of thing. But I'm not going to be a part of it anymore. I I can't. I'm I'm kind of on the margins. Yeah, same here. <laughs> and uh, I'm not out, but I'm not in. You know, I'm not. I'm I'm in, but not of. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, uh, 
because narcissistic leaders will always find a platform. They've got to, they need to, they will. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't want to be a part of that game. And yeah. so the best I can do is warn people. Mm. And somebody might speak prophetically to a narcissistic leader and they're, the chances of the narcissistic leader hearing it is very, very slim. But right. hopefully the people might might open their eyes and see, oh my goodness, this is not right. You know, this is not what I signed up for or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's that's what I'm hoping to do is that's why I continue to speak out against spiritual abuse and, you know, um, patriarchy and, you know, all that kind of thing in hopes that people will question it themselves and uh, either try to change it or escape it or, or whatever, you know, because I care like you, I want to help people. I want people to be good, healthy. I want them to be good. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's inside or outside the system, I, I want to be there for them to help them live healthy lives, you know, and to be free. Yeah. So I want to throw this question out there and I don't know that any of us can answer it, but maybe, maybe we can, but like, so you were talking about how a lot of times, you know, mm -hmm. pastors, spiritual leaders, they kind of, they rebrand themselves and then all of a sudden they're back up on the platform. What do you, but what do you think it is about our human nature that allows that to happen? That actually helps facilitate getting them back, knowing that they're, you know, they've been a, a, an acute, you know, or I don't know what the right word is, but they've been abusive. They've, you know, mm -hmm. they've done all these things. So what is it about our human nature that go, goes, that feels like we need to have that person in charge or a person in charge? Right. I'm asking both of you because like, that's kind of where my, my brain goes is the whole like, um, sociology part of it, I guess, if that's the right word, but just what is it about our, our makeup that we feel like we have to have um, somebody and especially somebody that has an abusive past, you know, back up on that pedestal. I, I was reading bell hooks recently and the uh, black feminist woman who um, talked about the pervasiveness of the patriarchy, for example, that it's everywhere. Everything is set up to favor the patriarchy. And I think it's the same way in religion is, is the pervasiveness of charismatic leadership, narcissistic leadership, mm -hmm. that it, <clears throat> when you get somebody who wants to be a leader and you get people who need a leader or want a leader mm -hmm. and you've got a system in place where there's a stage and the pews and a salary and the payers, the tithers, when, and you've got a theology that supports <laughs> this whole idea mm -hmm. and you've got a God that blesses it all. And you've got an ordination process that, you know, oils the path. Like it's all set in place so that when, as, as soon as somebody says, I am, I will be your leader. And they're like, we need you. You know, it's immediate. Mm -hmm. And especially if the guy can talk, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, is a, is a good speaker and is, can be scary and <laughs> authoritative. And mm -hmm. I know I've been around these guys. I know that I know they're smooth talkers. Mm -hmm. They are scary. Uh, and they, are assertive and they're aggressive and they will win. They're bullies. They will win. Mm -hmm. And um and when bullies aren't reined in, when there's uh you know a high tolerance for bullies, they will always win. They'll always dominate the playground. They will. So that's that's why I think it happens. That's why I think people like Mark Driscoll, Tony Jones, you know, all the all these all these guys, those Theo Bros out there. I think that's why they they rise to the top. Everything is set in place for it to happen. Mm -hmm. It's just so interesting to me. Like, yeah, I don't yeah, know. And I think the the followers know that what we need more than a, an effective management style leader is we need someone that's entertaining. Uh, and someone yeah. that can keep the crowds coming 
like you said, scare them every once in a while. So they do what they do. And even if they're a bully, like Donald Trump, That's you know, what I was thinking about. then we'll put up with that and we'll forgive them quickly because we know if our church has 2000 people coming, if, if that guy can't entertain us, yeah, then there's not going to be 2000 people coming anymore. Mm -hmm. And yeah, change. Um, and I think yeah. the pressure is also on because of the pressure's on because of, uh, you know, religious beliefs that we need to be quick to forgive people. Uh, yeah. Even when they don't say they're sorry, you know, even when they're, they may do it again and they didn't get really get any good help. We got a little biblical counseling, but no trauma informed counseling. They really didn't get better. Um, you know, well, yeah, like you said, it's all in the messaging because, you know, as Christians, we're supposed to forgive, right? So if somebody is a bully, mm -hmm. from the pulpit or whatever, you know, and they apologize, but it's kind of like the abusive spouse, you know, that beats their spouse and then cries and says how sorry they are. And then they take them back and the whole cycle repeats itself. So, yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. And we feel noble for forgiving them. Yeah, aren't we, true. Aren't we good people to forgive them just like Jesus would? But, you know, it just furthers abuse, I think, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Uh, I, I just watched a review of a, a new documentary that's out um, pub, um, directed by two women. I don't know if I'm going to watch it. It sounds pretty brutal. But uh, it's named Nice Picture, Lovely Life, something like that. Mm. And it's about this one of the girl women um, grew up in a home where the grandfather was a n noted pedophile mm. uh, predator. And the countless number of young children that he um, assaulted and so on. And it was a family secret. It was a family secret all the way down through the generations was a family secret mm. until her, her, his wife died, her grandmother. And then she found papers and blah, 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 blah. And on the story goes, and everybody, even though everybody knew everybody still let their kids around this man. Mm. And it's, it's, it's complicated for sure. But I think at the root of it is this whole patriarchy thing and that we're willing to, we are willing to sacrifice. Yeah. Even our children, right, to protect the patriarchy, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it's, it's a it's a damning um, statement to make, but I I I think that's true. I think that you know I, I know a lot of people who personally uh, are traumatized, were were hurt by Mars Hill mm -hmm. and that whole school mm -hmm. and that whole movement and. Um, people are willing to gloss that over and, and allow abusers back in power. It's almost like they're, they're willing to sacrifice their own children to perpetuate the, the, the that whole system of, of power. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. So that, that movement, that time must've had 150 leaders because everybody claims <laughs> to be the founding pastor of that stuff. Well, that didn't they? It wasn't. The, didn't they start a movement like Acts Two or something like that? Like That's that, correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's. I think that was all out of Mars Hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so there were a lot of pastors involved. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not a great historian, but I've had had to be here in the recent past, you know, to catch up to speed. I became a pastor yeah. in 1997, but. We were in small towns and we didn't really care about what was going on outside of us too much. But I learned later. So it's all, it's all, uh, it's come full circle, right? Yeah. It's all happening again. Yeah. It's I, uh, alarming. I believe not only is, you know, not only is the patriarchy making itself known again, uh, also abuse survivors um, are getting stronger and more vocal. Mm -hmm. And because of the internet, they understand, they get information quicker. Um, there's no 
there's no real gatekeepers of information anymore or theology or anything like that. That now um, we're just noticing a lot of very, very strong women speaking up, organizing, talking to each other. Um, and I, I don't think there's any gatekeepers for the internet. I'll agree with you there. Yeah. But there's gatekeepers when it comes to events. There yeah. you go. Yeah. And, and there's, you know, there's events that are limelighting these people. Yeah. And people, I'm surprised. I, I'll be honest with you guys, Carl and Laura. I'm surprised some of the people who are not saying anything. Right. Yeah, exactly. Going and supporting mm -hmm. and participating in these events with these people. Yeah. It, it just, And again, it goes to my point, you know, um, echoing bell hooks that the, the pervasiveness of it it's 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 everywhere it's almost like the air we breathe right in that whole culture there can't even be as much money in it as there was at one time you know at at this stage i can't imagine there's a whole lot of money to be made but for some reason it can it continues and we we somehow in the back of our minds think that's still the right way to go we need a and we've been been so conditioned. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I ask a different question? Yeah. So, uh, you have a community, and someone comes to you and says, "I'm now. I'm starting to question my beliefs. I'm starting to. Um, I think I need to heal. I think, you know, I got a lot of baggage. I'm hurting. So, what is your what is your first advice? A lot of our listeners are just you know just out of Christianity and. Mm -hmm. through things what would be your best advice to them well my 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 first concern is always to um you know sedate them <laughs> <laughs> emotionally uh, everything's fine nothing's wrong this is normal what you're experiencing there's nothing wrong it's kind of like a teenager you're going to the doctor with you know really painful knees and elbows and shoulders and this is just growth pains. This is totally normal. This means you're growing. So it's totally normal. You should feel this way. But here, have, here's a couple of Tylenol. But, uh, you know, this will continue for a few months. But, you know, you're going to grow a few inches. And uh, it, and it's the same with um, deconstructing. It's very painful at first. But part, part of the reasons it's painful is because we were told it was going to be painful, that this shouldn't be happening. And um, so as soon as you normalize it um they they calm people usually calm right down you know and don't rush it you know yeah wear a seatbelt, put on a helmet but yeah. enjoy the ride because uh this this is your life now if you're if you have any integrity you're going to stick with this and uh you know you're going to ride this through to the end and and it, it'll become beautiful mm -hmm. but it's it's like decompressing for sure it's like entering a different chamber of pressure but you're fine. This is totally normal. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the journey. Right. And it's just going to turn into a wonderful journey for you. And right. so that's my always my first step is just to sedate them, <laughs> get them relaxed and yeah. realize that this is totally normal and they're fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it may be lonely for a little while. Uh, you may have some PTSD because who am I? After yeah, yeah. You told me what, who to be, and what to think, and yeah. Who oh, yeah. I, what do I believe? And so there's, there's, oh some, yeah, you know, some disoriented mm -hmm. things. Yep, for but sure. Just relax, right? Yeah, just, you're, relax. Gonna, you're gonna be okay. It, it, and I, I think it's okay to admit to people that it's hard work. That it's gonna take some work. You, you know, this might may not be as easy as you think it is, um, but it's worth it. Yeah, but it's it's hard work only because the work's begun. I mean, before we were just sort of floating along on the on the river of uh, conformity. Yeah, you know, we were just believing what we were told to believe. But now that we're starting to question it, then then yeah, it take it takes work to figure out what you do believe and who you are, and to become your most authentic self and to trust your thoughts and trust your gut. Mm -hmm. You know, to take the steering wheel of your own life. Uh, it is it is scary at first, but eventually you learn how to drive. I have yet 
to hear people who, who took it seriously, continued on and then just dive back into a different form. But someone who, who just kept going, kept a steady pace, like you said, learned to calm down, mm -hmm. got some counseling, did some work. I, I have yet to hear people um, regret it. Um, if, they, yeah. if they're serious about it, like you said, if they have integrity, um, it's so far in seven or eight years, however long we've been going at this, about half as long as you, uh, we just noticed that that there's it's almost always good results. It's it's you mentioned authenticity. I don't yep. I don't think there's anything as important as authenticity to learn who right. you are yeah. and to live that way, to live out of your authentic self, like you just said. Yeah. Really, really important. And that's that's to me is what deconstruction is is uh, is is finally finding the freedom to um, be your most authentic self, and uh, that that you have the right to decide how to be spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's an important right and responsibility to to, to discover and take up. Yeah, I don't know if you know G M uh, Janine McConaughey. Mm, I don't. Uh, she wrote a book called Trauma and the Pews. She's a trauma informed counselor, and we see her kind of in the in the trauma areas, and so on. And as um, she explained to us the difference between an activist uh, and an advocate, she said an advocate works with people. It's what we all long to do, love people and so on. That's an advocate. I, I feel your pain and so on. Right. He said an activist is someone who works on systems and tries to change systems. But okay. he said never get those two backwards hmm. because you can't change people. You can only change systems. And the thing is, the patriarchy doesn't let hardly anyone mess with their system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because that's what it all revolves on, you know, and it's very, very hard to change the system. I, yeah. I guess we can create new systems, but like I said, this patriarchy is really pervasive. Yeah. It's hard. So, Dave, we, we're coming up on an hour now. <laughs> went fast. It went really fast. Yeah, we're past it, actually. Yeah, yeah cool. So, um, nice to talk with you guys. Yeah, and I just wanted to say, do you have? Anything that you didn't get to say that you wanted to say or any kind of word of advice or some kind of, we used to ask people, what do you want to put on your billboard that everybody could see? But you can take all those options. Just tell me what, what you want to tell us. And then we'll, I'll close you out. The, the well, sons come home and the dogs bark. And so we're yeah. descending into chaos here pretty quick. Uh, all right. No, I think I said everything I needed to say, but um, I'm really good at responding to emails and messages and, everything so if you want to reach out to me nakedpastor.com is my home base but uh, i'm on all the social media platforms as naked pastor and reach out um i love chatting with people and connecting so uh i'm here for you and um bless you on your deconstruction journey yeah for the listeners out there i want to thank you guys for tw for tuning in um we appreciate you all um we respect you we love you and we hope you take our con our conversation today in the right light. Um, we're not trying to bash people. We're not trying to compete um, with other people. But we're deeply concerned, I think. At least I, I know I am, and I think David is also deeply concerned about when people get hurt and, and systems that keep enabling the same practices that hurt people. So... Um, we're deeply concerned about that, and that's the intent of this pro podcast is to shed light on that, and hopefully um, whoever can will change that uh, sometime in the future. But I want to remind you, as always, to be where you are, be who you are, and be at peace. Thank you for joining us today on the Desert Sanctuary Podcast. Remember, all who wander in the desert are not lost. We believe all of our stories are sacred. We are always here if you need someone to hear your story. Check out our blog on Pathios and also our YouTube channel. And stay tuned for our Leaning Forward Conference. Remember, we love you. And be at peace.